Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here this afternoon to host three excellent scholars to talk about a new book by Ike Freiman, who's here today with us. Uh, Ike has written an excellent book called One Belt, One Road. I have it right here, Chinese Power Meets the World, published by Harvard University Press in 2021. Ike is a research analyst, director of the Indo-Pacific at Greenmantle, and he's a doctoral candidate at Balliol College, Oxford. I'm also here with Dr. Patrick Cronin, my colleague at the Hudson Institute, who's the Asia Pacific Security Chair, and Eric Brown, a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute who studies Asian and Middle East affairs. I think all of them will offer some interesting insights into OBOR. I'd like to start this afternoon uh, by highlighting some of the things that I found most interesting about Ike's book. First, let's define OBOR, uh, which, which is what he does right early on in the book. Um, he defines the initiative started in 2013 by President Xi as China's efforts to fund infrastructure around the world. It comprises about 65 countries. And OBOR is really the link that brings together two separate initiatives. One is the Overland Initiative called the New Silk Road Economic Belt. And another is the Maritime Silk Road that brings together the network of port cities across the South China Sea, the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. And the digital aspects equally important are also part of both of these networks. Overall, Ike describes OBOR as a global process of realignment with China, which I think is also a really interesting um, overview. But what is wonderful about his book, not only is it well-written and accessible, but that he challenges three key misconceptions about OBOR. And this, I think, will form a little bit of our debate and discussion today to, to see if Eric and Patrick agree with this characterization. So Ike essentially argues that it's wrong to see OBOR as a seamless master Chinese plan. He emphasizes the bottom-up nature of OBOR and the infrastructure investments and the various uh, programs underway. Second, he notes that we should not overemphasize the backlash against OBOR. A lot of the press has actually been about how there's been a backlash in many of the uh, OBOR countries, that people don't like it. And Ike actually has a different perspective. And third, he also questions whether or not OBOR is as much of a debt trap as most analysts have also described. Um, most analysts have described OBOR as predatory, using that word, predatory loaning. Uh, Ike actually argues that actually this isn't always the case and a lot of these projects are driven internally um, by local needs and local political demands. So I'd like to uh, now turn to Ike a little bit. Hopefully I've characterized the three points correctly to tell us a little bit more about the book. And then I'll turn to Eric and Patrick to comment on Ike's observations to see if, if they agree or disagree with him. And then we'll go from there. So thanks so much. Hopefully I characterized it okay. Well, thank you, Nadia, for the kind introduction. Thank you to Eric and to Patrick for being here. I'm thrilled to be here at Hudson uh, to share findings which are in a sense a response to uh, a turn in US policy towards China that began in 2018 with remarks that the former Vice President Mike Pence uh, made at this institution. Uh, in that speech, which marks a uh, turn toward a much more hawkish uh, and assertive US policy towards China, Pence uh, pointed to the case of the Chinese port of Hambantota in the south of Sri Lanka. And he said, if you wanted uh, an example of how Chinese lending or Chinese geoeconomic practices are coercive and destructive to partner or recipient countries, you can look no further than Sri Lanka, uh, which took out more debt than it could afford, built a white elephant that would, couldn't pay for itself and ultimately had to hand it back over to China on a 99 year lease. Uh, the problem is that I had already begun research on Hambantota about a year before the handover. Uh, as a, a pure accident, I'd been given a grant and was doing research on the ground, interviewing local officials, local residents, and so forth. And I returned a year later after the handover in order to ask some of the same questions of local people, but also elites from across the political spectrum in Sri Lanka. What I found surprised me 
and I think is very significant, not only for US policy towards South Asia, but in fact, how we see the broader implications of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Because what I found on the ground was that Vice President Pence seemed to have it all wrong. Uh, most Sri Lankans weren't particularly concerned about the economic or strategic implications of handing over the port. In fact, in the, in the years that followed the handover, there seemed to be a realignment in which even the political parties and elites who had opposed China as the Hambantota port was being built were reconciled and became more pro-Beijing than ever before. So my question was, if this could happen in Sri Lanka, the paradigmatic example of a predatory Belt and Road project, perhaps this could happen anywhere else. So over the course of the next few years, I set out to understand how exactly this model had come to be of uh, large capital intensive loans from Chinese state banks, generally to fund big infrastructure projects that were to be constructed by Chinese state owned enterprises. And then also to understand from the recipient country perspective, how uh, local people understood the balance of risks and opportunities of partnering with China, potentially getting a large flood of investment, uh, but putting themselves in a position where they could be politically coerced because of debt. And what I found in short is that China's, uh, China's model that we have become, that we've come to associate with the Belt and Road actually preceded Xi Jinping and has very little to do with One Belt, One Road Road per se. A lot of what Xi Jinping was doing uh, through, under the guise of the Belt and Road was uh, claiming credit for projects that had been begun by his predecessors. And in fact, trying to use a slogan to ram everything together into something that would be more strategically coherent and supportive of Chinese national interests. But he was also doing something more, something political and ideological that was imprinted on top of the physical infrastructure that China was building. He was creating a historical metaphor of the Silk Road, which he was proposing as his great ideological contribution, essentially making the case that by rebuilding the Silk Road, he would be defining a model for how China should relate to the countries on its periphery and in the wider world. And the claim was that this is not a new idea, and it's also not a Western idea uh, taken after the Marshall Plan. It's a Chinese imperial model of harmonious relations between China and smaller countries, lubricated by trade and investment, which ultimately serves political rather than economic purposes. In other words, Silk Road is a euphemism, if you will, for the ancient tributary system that the Ming and the Qing dynasties used to manage relations with their neighbors. Korea, Vietnam, Japan, Malaysia, many Central Asian principalities were one day in the past tributary powers. And the claim that has been made in Belt and Road propaganda and implicitly in the re revisions that have been made to Chinese history textbooks all seem to serve this vision that Xi Jinping is restoring an ancient model for how China should do business with its neighbors. And the claim is essentially to justify the sorts of projects that China had already been building. Because if you build it, if you make an offer, she, she is saying to the Chinese institutions, banks and SOEs, even if you lose money in the short term, the longer term political relationships that you establish as a result and the status gains that you give to China as a result will be worth it in the long run. So this is, I think, from an analysis of how the Belt and Road has been pitched through propaganda and how it has been institutionalized is how China thinks about the Belt and Road. And that's significant because it means Beijing might be willing to take losses on individual projects if it sees them as a down payment on a longer term relationship. But if you look at it from the perspective of recipient countries, and this is the other big uh, controversial claim in the book, there are all sorts of reasons to do business with China including to take out loans for very risky projects that go beyond the commercial viability of the project itself. Uh, for political elites in Sri Lanka, uh, for the Rajapaksa regime, it was essentially to stay in power, to bring home the bacon to the constituency in the south of the country that had delivered him to power. 
and to pay off various uh, local groups which were affiliated with his brothers. Uh, and for that reason, it was not surprising that the opposition would have been opposed. Uh, but when the opposition finally took power on an anti-China platform, the logic of commercial engagements with China that would keep them in power suddenly started to work in their favor. And that's why they were reconciled. There's also a regional geopolitical logic for why a Sri Lankan leader may want to have uh, good relations with China, which is that India is a much bigger threat. Historically speaking, India has intervened many times in Sri Lankan domestic politics. Indeed, during the last Sri Lankan civil war, the Indian military even intervened directly. And Rajapaksa, particularly in, in the early years of his presidency, uh, was on the outs in the international community because of war crimes committed in the Civil War. So in a sense, partnership with China gave him geopolitical leverage in turning around and trying to prevent his case from being sent to human rights courts in the West. And indeed, it, he never got to trial uh, for some of the atrocities that were committed. Mm -hmm. So this is a model that we can see in closing, not only in Sri Lanka, but in all sorts of countries and contexts. And so I think it is dangerous for this reason to point to individual cases where Belt and Road projects go belly up commercially, or even individual cases where uh, leaders in Belt and Road recipient countries make a big show of standing up to China. Because if we look beyond the headlines at the structural trends, I think we find that countries like Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, in China's neighborhood, but also countries like the United Arab Emirates, uh, which has, has long been close to the West, see longer term strategic advantages to at least keeping the door open to a relationship with China and the Belt and Road acceding symbolically without giving anything tangible to China's tributary idea is an easy way to do it. And so if this is true, I think Belt and Road does fit very fundamentally into how the US should see great power competition with China. Uh, we are competing not only project for project in terms of infrastructure financing, we're also competing ideologically in terms of whether the global order will be a liberal one uh, and one that is governed by rules that, that we have been, become familiar with and accustomed to over the last few decades, or whether a regional order or world order will become defined by Chinese tributary ideas, uh, one in which China is not only at the top of the pecking order, but Xi Jinping himself stands on top the red carpet and that he must be satisfied in order to get uh, access to the Chinese market, access to Chinese technology, access to Chinese geopolitical backing. I think we need to understand that this is the trade-off that smaller countries stuck between the US and China face. And if we want to prevent uh, US allies, US partners, particularly in the Indo-Pacific from being pulled into reliance on China, I think we need to do a lot of hard thinking about how we're going to offer them a better option uh, to keep them from entering something they might have a much harder time exiting. Okay. Thanks, Ike, that was, that was really fascinating. Um, I'd like to turn to, to Eric and Patrick. Um, I would also like to ask, but I can do this sort of circle back, um, is if COVID has changed any of the assumptions or uh, aspects of what you've discussed, because you wrote the book, I mean, it came out, I guess, presumably you wrote it right before the pandemic hit. And so have some of the implications of COVID have ripple effects in the region to change any of your fundamental uh, assumptions? If you could just maybe comment on that quickly, and then I do want to turn to Eric and Patrick. So when I wrote the book, it was, yes, largely pre-COVID. And uh, COVID happened, and I made the calculation uh, that it seemed logical that COVID would only accelerate uh, all of the structural forces that I had identified in the book. I anticipated there might be a short-term decline in Chinese overseas lending. Thing. Indeed, we did see that. But in the longer term, I didn't see any structural pressure for China to change what, what One Belt, One Road means domestically, what it means in terms of Xi Jinping's own cult of personality, if nothing else. And it seemed to me that a global pandemic that would ravage uh, developing countries and 
put all countries that were already uh, financially strapped in even more difficult situations would only give China more leverage and make relations with China more important. And indeed, I think we've seen over the last few months that reports of Obor's death from coronavirus have been greatly exaggerated. Xi Jinping and senior officials from the National Development and Reform Commission are continuing to trumpet it. And they're indicating that coming out of the pandemic, uh, China will use the pandemic economic crisis as an excuse to refine the Belt and Road and discipline it, focusing, I think, on three particular domains, which are public health, including vaccines, green tech, and digital services. If it is the case that China refines the Belt and Road to be about these three things, and they phase out their, their funding of new uh, tr traditional capital intensive uh, infrastructure like the Hamantota port. I think it's quite possible that Belt and Road becomes even more effective going forward because it offers a clearer value proposition to recipient countries. It has more to do with China buying their goods and exposure to the Chinese economic dynamo pulling them out of pandemic recession. Uh, and it has less to do with taking on massive risk through huge loans as the price of engaging with China. So it's possible that China has figured out a way to use COVID as an excuse uh, to, to boost this thing. And I think we should be very concerned, particularly in the digital domain, that it will lead to closer security cooperation between China and some of its neighbors and the export of China's author techno authoritarian toolkit things like financial technology, but also facial recognition and Huawei, other sorts of uh, tools which could be useful to an autocrat or aspiring autocrat uh, who wants to apply those at home. I think we're seeing some examples of that in countries like, um, oh, we can go into this later, but I, I think we're seeing thanks, some thanks, examples Ike. of this in Africa that we should be tracking. Thanks, Ike. Okay, Eric, so why don't you offer your thoughts? Uh, one, do you agree with Ike's, um, his analysis of Obor and the misconceptions that we've had about it? Maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about your thoughts and some of the questions you might have for him. Well, thank you, Nadia, and, and thank you, Ike. I, I uh, have to say, I think your book is a, an excellent contribution to the discussions that we're having in the United States and elsewhere about BRI. It serves as a great corrective to uh, some misguided analysis or perhaps some analysis that may be too far ahead of its time, uh, but which may be uh, uh, proved to be more accurate in, in years to come, for example, having to do with debt trapping. Um, I think you're absolutely right in describing um, uh, this phenomenon of debt trapping as not actually being something that we're seeing much of right now, at least on, in, in terms of the Humban Tota model. Instead, we're seeing uh, PRC, um, uh, in light of this uh, global economic crisis that we're dealing with, we're seeing PRC banks um, and companies uh, restructuring debt with a whole uh, range of recipient countries. Um, in, in effect, what they're doing, as I understand it, is stringing out the repayments um, uh, for, for loans that are due. Um, and one could imagine that for a country that has political control over banks, um, and private companies, this is, uh, this is something that they have quite a bit of flexibility to do up until a certain point. I guess one question I have uh, for Ike is, um, how long do you think the PRC can keep this dance up? Um, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a far less robust PRC economy today than, than many expected it would be just five years ago. And it costs uh, to to um, to continue to extend repayments out uh, as far as as they've been doing. Um, uh, in the meantime, I think that it's key for the PRC to continue to get returns on some of its investments, BRI and non-BRI investments, in uh, in countries like in Europe and elsewhere. In part because uh, PRC has a clear strategic interest in making sure that the democracies don't um, join together in, in coming up with uh, a collective response to some of the economic predation that we have seen um, by BRI projects in different parts of the world. Um, and also because uh, returns on uh, investments from uh, returns on investments in countries like Europe and elsewhere is absolutely crucial for keeping 
uh, the, the BRI geoeconomic gambit in the global south going um, uh, for, for some time to come. Um, I agree fundamentally with your assessment that a lot of this, uh, a lot of what has occurred in BRI is a bottom-up phenomenon. It's certain that a lot of these deals are uh, addressing uh, needs and desires among populations that have been left out of the post-1991 globalization phenomenon uh, or who have opted out of the post-1991 uh, uh, globalization phenomenon. Um, I guess my question uh, for you and for our group here is, um, uh, where is this uh, era of PRC-led globalization taking a lot of these countries? Um, uh, uh, my concern, and you had suggested in, in your comments, and I know that it's a subject that you bring up in your book, is that PRC's ultimate ambition is to give Eurasia, by which I, and by extension also parts of Oceania and Africa, a new operating system. Uh, one that's ultimately far more supportive uh, for the Chinese Communist Party's interests, um, particularly its desire to maintain its monopoly of power at home. Um, and in the process of lubricating uh, various socioeconomic elites in various countries around the world, the PRC is essentially uh, creating a situation where development will become highly and increasingly so, highly uneven, um, uh, and where the PRC will ulti ultimately also acquire an equity in sustaining certain socioeconomic elites that can continue to control the BRI narrative and suppress any opposition to BRI that may emerge. I think it's wrong to say that there is not opposition to BRI emerging all over Asia. Um, uh, for example, in Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, as we know, have suffered from an enormous amount of, of, of surveillance and, and genocidal repression. As we know, control of Xinjiang is absolutely fundamental to the continental component of BRI. Um, uh, and what we're seeing is the creation, in some respects, of smaller Xinjiangs all over the world. Uh, the Hmong peoples in Southeast Asia, for example, have been dislocated from their homes largely because of, of, of uh, BRI projects. Um, in a place like Pakistan, uh, you certainly hear from official media um, uh, uh, an enormous amount of enthusiasm for BRI, um, uh, but you don't hear from the peoples of Baluchistan or from Gilgit Baltistan about what BRI investment has meant for them. You also don't hear um, uh, the stories from mom and pop shops in the industrious province of Sindh, which has not benefited from BRI the way political elites in the Punjab have benefited uh, from BRI investments. These mom and pop shops in Sindh are, are in some respects, uh, um, their, their bottom line is being detrimentally affected from uneven investment. Um, in the process of all of this, um, I think that a lot of these BRI investments are creating an enabling environment in which graft and corruption um, uh, is, has a far greater opportunity to succeed. I think it's important to keep in mind that a lot of these BRI deals could not plausibly be funded on the private market, in part because of their lack of opacity, um, and also because I think they're lubricated, I think as I had suggested, by, um, uh, by uh, corruption. And we have to keep in mind uh, uh, that you know, in, the, in the invention of modern capitalism, which largely was an Atlantic world uh, phenomenon, uh, corruption was seen as um, uh, a real uh, Republican sin. Um, why was that? Because corruption creates not only economic inequality, but it is also a driver of political factionalism, and therefore it is a driver of political instability. And I believe that what you're seeing in, in this era of PRC globalization, PRC-led globalization, is, is um, a real uh, uh, um, engine of future political instability in a number of strategically consequential parts of the world. And that's going to become increasingly a problem for the socioeconomic elites in these countries, as well as for the PRC. And I suspect that part of the techno totalitarianism that I could referred to that PRC is exporting now is designed to get ahead of that.
And all of this, um, what does this all mean for world order? I think from, from one perspective, it is achieving what the PRC uh, wants to achieve, and that is a net gain for the forces of autocracy and for oligarchy in the world. And it's ultimately a loss for the prospects of Republican government based on political equality, rule of law, and transparency. And I think that it goes to the core of what we're dealing with, with BRI and the kind of economic predation that it, that it enables. And I think Ike's book uh, really helps to laser in on these larger uh, questions of norms and of world order, which is at the core of this, of this uh, phenomenon that we're dealing with. So thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. I think before, before you respond, Ike, I'd like to turn to Patrick um, and then we can sort of work on some of the themes that have, uh, have come up. I mean, in terms of Eric's themes, he agrees with a lot of a lot of your book, but perhaps argues that you overstate the lack of opposition in countries. Um, uh, he agrees that essentially it's a net gain for autocracy, but also will create some instability as well. Uh, so uh, those are sort of some of the the issues that we could talk about after. But Patrick, why don't you jump in a little bit and and uh, offer your thoughts from your part of the world? Well, Nadia, thank you, and Ike, um, congratulations on an exceptional book. Uh, you've explained OBOR uh, very well as both a means of domestic and foreign objectives for Xi Jinping in China. Uh, and you've explained a phenomenon that in your own description, uh, you point out was not really meant to be bounded, clear, transparent, or even strategic in some cases. Um, and yet you've managed to do that. Uh, and you've done it far beyond in much more detail than your brief presentation on this program today. I mean, having read your book very carefully, I mean, it easily allows a framework for thinking through not just the belt and the road, but also uh, the polar uh, silk road uh, sort of gambit that I know you're writing on, um, but also the digital silk road, the space information corridor with the IDU satellite navigation network that is displacing uh, the global positioning system that the United States helped create during the Cold War. Um, and uh, we're now losing yet one more, one more domain in effect. Um, from, from my perspective, and as somebody who also was the third ranking official at the US Agency for International Development and well aware of the sloppiness, the messiness, the inchoate nature of development assistance and of foreign assistance more generally. Um, and yet OBOR is a project that transcends even foreign assistance. So it's, it, it cuts across um, agencies and, and, and government policies that we don't even devise or have. Um, which makes it very difficult for the United States to think of a prescription. Can, as President Joe Biden uh, has vowed uh, in his idea of outcompeting China, you know, can we outcompete OBOR? What would that mean? Or what would it, and, and you've suggested, of course, in your conclusion, I, um, you know, three, all, three broad alternatives in terms of trying to contain uh, OBOR, trying to selectively engage it, or trying to go all in and and maybe steer it toward a better course or at least uh, manage it better by, by being a member. Um, I think it's gonna take all three of those uh, tacks uh, just to try to uh, bring about our inchoate set of bureaucracies, the private sector, our allies and partners into, uh, into a, an effective response. Um, so in addition to reading Ike Fryman's great book, uh, I think we also need to be uh, steeped a bit in our own institutions and in our own um, archaic institutions in some ways, institutions that were not really built for the 21st century. We're still laboring with them right now. Let me just go on to explain why this is a quandary for US policymakers beyond our institutions. Um, and it goes back to whether we are providing an alternative. And Ike talks about this in the book. He, you mentioned it in his brief remarks. Um, we are not providing effective alternatives to OBOR, which is why there isn't the backlash to OBOR, at least not a sustained backlash openly. Um, there is, I agree with Eric, a backlash privately in almost all Indo-Pacific partner uh, areas. But publicly there's not because who wants to look a gift horse in the mouth? Who wants to, you know, if there's no better alternative uh, on offer, then um, suddenly a tributary system doesn't look so bad, <laughs> um, even if that's not always the intent of, of China. So the Biden administration, as I understand it, is trying to reinvest in our fundamentals here at home, our people, human capital, infrastructure, economy, our political institutions. Those are long-term efforts, by the way. So we're not gonna see immediate return on that, but that's going to be important for long-term competition. Uh, 
we're going to have more joined up policy responses, more whole of government responses. The quick fix on that was to appoint someone like Kurt Campbell, extremely able as an Indo-Pacific czar at the White House. At least somebody up at top in the White House is overseeing how to pull the threads of policy together. And that's important. And somebody who also knows how to work with allies and partners, because uh, clearly these are efforts that are going to take Japan's money in many cases, because they have the, the actual lead in infrastructure development and major investment in Southeast Asia, um, for example, uh, but not just Southeast Asia. Um, but also we're gonna have to focus on allies and partners in coming up with the rule sets that are gonna govern the rest of the century as we deal with revolutions in digital telecommunications, green technologies that Ike mentioned, uh, also the development of outer space uh, among other areas. Um, and you know, having worked on development, every development project has to be ground truth in what is the demand? What is the buy-in locally in any area? That's where the reality is. That's why policies can't be made in Beijing or in Washington and then just sort of transplanted somewhere around the world uh, and expect to flourish and, and be sustained over time. Uh, they have to really come from overlapping uh, identified interests from the recipients and from those who are providing the donor assistance, the support, the technical assistance, uh, and so on. So what do we need to do to compete with OBOR? <clears throat> from my perspective, uh, combining sort of Ike's three uh, choices into one uh, sort of uh, one broad approach. <clears throat> I think if you think just about Southeast Asia, which is at the epicenter of a lot of Chinese competition with the United States right now, and with our key allies in the Indo-Pacific, especially Japan, Australia, but also India, um, I think you see that um, we have to get back into the trade game. I mean, this was one of the problems with the responses from Obama and Trump to the China challenge was we crippled our own uh, economic card and response at, while China was then given open running room about uh, trade. So right now, the United States is not a member of the what is now the CP Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Conference of Progressive uh, TPP. Um, we're not a member of RCEP, uh, which, is, uh, which is now up and running as a multilateral trade organization. Um, so the United States is going to have to start right now renegotiating our way. It'll take several years at best back into the CPTPP. We've got to be seen as a future trading partner that's going to be growing, not just shrinking in years ahead. Then we can overlay our development assistance and foreign assistance programs strategically, selectively. Um, so think, think digital, think maritime and maritime sea lines of communication. So the one uh, initiative that we actually did, I think, during the Trump administration that came to some fruition was the Development Finance Corporation. And setting that up helps mobilize more resources for infrastructure and other investments. But it's only a fraction of what OBOR is looking at, even if we discount the high numbers sometimes associated with China's uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. Um, but the one initiative that was funded by the Def Development Finance Corporation last year was the undersea cable, the Trans-Pacific Network subsea connection. That was the first direct subsea connection between the United States and Southeast Asia that did not go through the South China Sea. Um, and that's important as China grows its sort of influence in the South China Sea area and beyond. Now, it's no surprise to hear suddenly China floating a $39 billion idea of a city and seaport in Papua New Guinea, which would help intersect that, that undersea cable not to mention submarine and other potential sea lines of communication from Australia up through the second island chain into the first island chain, which is where you get into the military and security implications of what seem like economic and political uh, maneuvers. In fact, there are also military dimensions to this, as, as we all know. Um, we, need, we need to go into the green technology sector as well. And I think the Biden administration will want to do this anyhow. But if you think about a key actor like Vietnam, where there's so much potential for solar, offshore wind power and so on, they're, they're going to almost double the number of coal fired power plants here in the next three decades. Um, we already have two US projects for uh, LNG uh, power plants. We can also get into renewables and other areas. That's the kind of thing that we can do and we need Japan's help because right now Japan is financing some of those coal fired power plants. So we're gonna have to work together on that. Um, Ultimately, though, it's going to come down to rules of the road, I think, Nadia. We're going to have to work with sometimes called you know, smaller groups, the D10, the Democracy 10, the T10, the Technology 10 type of forums um, that could be 
expansions of the G7, if you will, um, in which you're trying to find like-minded countries in Europe, in the Middle East, the United States, Asia, um, who can come together and help um, write standards and norms that we can then sell and market to China and the others. They want to be, in, they want, they're meant to be inclusive, but these could be way stations toward the international rules. None of this is going to be easy. But if you think about areas where you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions or cyberspace rules or outer space rules, all of these are areas where we're going to need to have to work with China. We're going to have to coexist. Uh, and I think um, they coincide with a, a response, an effective response to OBOR as well, because providing the, the foreign assistance projects backed by trade, backed by our security cooperation, and working together engaged on the rules of the road gives us the best chance of managing uh, together with, with everybody um, uh, the, the grandiose OBOR challenge. So thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Although in some ways that was a little bit dep depressing. <laughs> you painted a sort of a dire picture of, of whether or not we, we can catch up um, given the, the, the nature of our tools, uh, which are old and, and not necessarily up, up to where they need to be in terms of our development assistance programs and the way we approach development. You also mentioned that in your book, Ike, at the end, I, I remember you had an interesting line in there about, you know, can we, how do we even duplicate this sort of model, uh, this investment infrastructure driven model Model that China has, um, if it's possible. Uh, some, you know, uh, so some of the themes that I took fr from, from your remarks, Patrick, uh, you know, one, we can do this maybe with improved cooperation among allies and partners, uh, some of the subgroups. Two, maybe do we focus regionally, right? There's 65 or so countries across OBOR. Uh, do we scatter our approach or do we decide to focus in certain se particular sectors, particular regions? Uh, so maybe, maybe Ike, you could comment a little bit on, on that and on Eric and, and Patrick's comments. There's a lot, a lot, a lot to comment on. <laughs> I'm muted. Okay, I'm unmuted now. This is a terrific and very helpful and stimulating set of reflections. And I wish I had time to address every point that has been raised. But let me zoom out, try to give some context for how I see things and then try to touch on as many of these points as I can. As I alluded to in my remarks before, I think we need to start by diagnosing the challenge before we start prescribing solutions. Even though I agree with everything that Patrick said about things that the United States ought to be doing, I think part of reconciling ourselves to what this is, is understanding first and foremost that this is going to be a long-term, very likely multi-decade challenge that will persist for as long as Xi Jinping rules China and possibly thereafter in a different form. And I think our objective above all has to be to prevent the Belt and Road from coalescing into a geopolitical block. I don't think it would become a geopolitical block of 65 countries, but if it's even China, Russia, Pakistan, Iran, and a few others, that's potentially an extremely dangerous and problematic authoritarian axis in opposition to not only American national interests, uh, but the interests of our allies and partners. And I think that could pose a very serious long-term challenge to America's national security and our ability to secure our interests around the world. So we need to remember that if we can work around this thing so that 10, 20 years from now, we can exhale and say, well, thank God that never became a geopolitical block, then I think we will have achieved our objective or at least we will have protected our most vital national interest at stake. Point two is this isn't going away. It may change its form. It may change its name again to the Belt and Road Project. They may change the acronym. But the point is, even if the Chinese economy uh, is, is slowing in its rate of growth, uh, as Eric alluded to, it is still growing. It grew in 2020, despite the pandemic. It is conservatively estimated to grow 7% this year, possibly as much as eight. And China's portfolio of foreign direct investments is not large relative to the size of its economy. In fact, Japan's FDI stock is worth 30% of its GDP, and China's FDI stock is worth only about 
of its GDP. So if China just grows its proportion of overseas holdings to move into line with Japan or the Western European countries or the United States, we're talking about a doubling, an increase of literally trillions of dollars of new Belt and Road or Belt and Road related projects. So there's, there's a lot in which many domains in which this can grow. There's many domain, industries conceptually or new regions to which it could expand. Some of these have been named the Arctic, outer space, cyberspace, uh, the Caribbean. So there's plenty of room for this to keep growing and for it to shed its less effective arms and grow stronger in its most nefarious or problematic arms. So we need to be able to re recognize that while this is a single loosely defined conceptual thing within China, it manifests in different ways in different regions. And we need to be able to both deal with it in a structural macro way and also on a much finer level of analysis, zoom into the regional context and prescribe targeted solutions to keep it out of specific countries, specific industries, specific systems that could threaten our interests. Uh, the third point is we have to recognize, and this is ultimately the big takeaway of my book, small countries have more bargaining power in a bipolar system than a unipolar system. This is true in the Cold War, but it's also been shown throughout history that countries can get more foreign aid, they can sign up to alliances more readily, they can access investment more readily when there's two superpowers who particularly are afraid of uh, a bandwagoning situation where any country that's on the fence could tip a chain of dominoes and cause them to lose the conflict. So for this reason, I think we need to recognize that many countries in Southeast Asia or the Middle East, to take two regional examples, they don't want the United States and China to go to war. They don't want the United States and China to have a serious conflict that will hurt their economy. But there is, a, there is an end state for them in which the US and China find a way to compete without, go, at, without being at each other's throats that is actually effective for them, that allows them to get maximum autonomy and maximum economic and technological benefits from both sides. And we should recognize that for that reason, many of our partners do not want to pick sides. And if we pressure them too hard, they might fall on the other side of the fence. Uh, I think we should bear this in mind as we pursue a slate of projects that includes all of the above that Patrick mentioned, multilateral cooperation, standard setting, uh, targeted deals. Uh, but we should recognize above all that these are countries that want to preserve their autonomy and see new opportunities to assert their autonomy in a bipolar system. The next point is uh, to get to points that were raised by both Eric and Patrick, which is very important, and by you, Nadia, too, which is, should we be competing with our own model of infrastructure development? I think the answer is no. And there's a couple of reasons why. The first is from a civil engineering perspective, the Chinese are just very good at building roads, bridges, dams, airports, ports, traditional infrastructure. They can do it at scale because they have subsidized materials and subsidized labor, but they also have a lot of engineering know-how because they've been doing more of it. They did so much of it at home. And they have patient capital because the money comes from Chinese policy banks that don't need to be paid back on a, a normal time scale, if at all, and can tolerate a, an exchange, a, a, an interest rate that is below what a, uh, what a partner country would pay on the bond market. So it's going to be very expensive and probably very inefficient for the United States to try to compete with China building a port for a port and a road for a road. And I don't see why we would, because I, unless there's a specific concern about debt distress, if China wants to build smart cities in Zambia or roads in the DRC, for example, I think that's fine. And we should celebrate China if and when it undertakes projects that fulfill global development objectives. I think we should concentrate our resources on pushing back against areas where it actually could degrade our national interests. Huawei was a very good example of where we were right to push back. I think space 
outer space is deeply concerning. We, I, I would not want US allies and partners signing up for Beidou. That would be another one. Uh, standard setting in order to prevent the spread of Chinese uh, financial technology companies would be another. Uh, but we need to be more targeted in the way we deploy our resources. I am all for uh, increasing the foreign aid budget, encouraging through the Development Finance Corporation or other sorts of uh, quasi-private, quasi-public entities to do more lending. Uh, but we need to recognize if we try to compete with China everywhere, we will exhaust our resources and we can achieve most of our objectives if we, for example, keep it out of our neighborhood by making sure Central American and Caribbean nations don't sign up, by keeping China out of the Arctic, by focusing on some of these higher tech dimensions of it, and letting China uh, spend resources doing things in sub-Saharan Africa that are actually either for the greater good or not particularly detrimental to American interests. And I think if we celebrate China for doing those things, and we give China a glide path out to make, China, to make the Belt and Road something that's not actually a geopolitical block, but something that China can achieve status and recognition and honor on the global stage for doing, uh, then we can truly achieve the best of both worlds and give Xi Jinping an outcome that he can be happy with. Thanks, Ike. Um, before I turn back to, to Eric and Patrick, um, so a couple things. One, another tool that hasn't been mentioned but is important and was strengthened over the past few years is Exim Bank, the Export Import Bank. Um, the previous administration uh, succeeded in getting an authorization for Exim uh, for seven years, which is pretty meaningful in the development world because it allows you to plan out in ways that often you can't. It's it's just it's a relevant, important tool. In some ways, what you're talking about is I'll coin this term, you know, target it's targeted competition, right? It's 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 approaching OBOR, competing with it, but in a very targeted way. And another term comes to mind or a phrase and sort of making up, but asymmetric development, right? That we're we're focusing maybe our develop development in areas that, that speak to our strengths. Although I think the Army Corps of Engineers would uh, would definitely push back, that, uh, you know, in terms of their expertise. But I think your point about scale and cost is is true, right? They have the expertise. The Army Corps of Engineers can build anything anywhere, but the scale and the cost, it's a completely different model. Um, but I, I like this uh, idea of, you know, figuring out a plan of targeted competition in this domain and the areas that you set forth, FinTech, outer space, standards, more. Um, and then thinking asymmetrically where our, uh, you know, where we focus our development to compete in OBOR. Um, and some of that could go sort of to the interest to, to the values, right? Uh, schools, I mean, all of these sort of areas that are considered uh, traditionally softer, but really have enormous strategic implications in terms of promoting values of republicanism to Eric's point. So and public um, health is another big one. Pardon? Because the Chinese have vaccines which don't work perfectly, right. but they work. Right. Right. And they're exporting right. them to the developing world because they don't really need, they're not on a timeline to vaccinate their high risk at home. And even countries like Brazil that fiercely resisted the Chinese vaccines, which were rooting for them to fail, have now approved them and are starting to roll them out because they just don't have a choice. And the developing world has hoarded vaccines. Canada has three times as many as it needs to vaccinate its whole population. So joining COVAX, uh, the vaccine sharing initiative run by the WHO, which President Biden has done, but not yet actually funded with doses. This is going to be a hugely important thing, particularly in the second half of the year, once we achieve mass vaccination here in the United States, to make sure that we're leveraging all of this over procurement that we did uh, to help the countries that are most in need. That's going to deprive China of the opportunity to change the narrative on what actually happened in COVID in the early months of 2020. Uh, but it's also an opportunity to pursue our own national interests because if this virus becomes endemic and continues to mutate in the developing world, it will eventually come back into our borders and infect Americans. So I think this is a global challenge that we would be very well advised to put resources behind. In the, in the medium term, I think we are partners with China. 
in terms of eradicating this pandemic. But beyond, public health has long been one of our core competencies. It's a way we can do an enormous amount of good with a relatively small amount of resources. We did it with AIDS, with PEPFAR, and I think we can do it again with other infectious diseases and other public health issues that will emerge or be aggravated as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, I think we could probably have a whole show just on, on COVAX vaccine, public health externally, because right now we're seeing a Europe that hasn't been able to roll out the vaccine as fast as it can and really angry and discouraged populations in Europe. So I think it is more, it's pretty complicated. That that particular case is pretty complicated, but we're not going to get get into that um, right now. So Eric, why don't you comment on um, some of Ike's final recommendations and then Patrick, and then we're about to wrap pretty soon. Thanks. This is, this is great. I mean, I, I have to say I, I agree with most of what I had said and, and what Patrick and, and Nadia has all, have also said. Um, so I won't go over, re go over that again. Uh, I will reinforce a few things. Um, we are not going to be able to out China China, particularly in infrastructure development, as I had said, even if we have the most superb and uh, nimble uh, uh, alliance of democracies, of all the advanced democracies in the world, it's not going to happen. Um, uh, uh, and so what we need to do in terms of targeting, I think is to focus on those high-end systems that Ike and Nadia had referred to. My larger concern, uh, I think that our strategic objective needs to be exactly what was said to prevent this from turning into a geopolitical block. And my concern is that if PRC can embed itself in the information and intelligence and financial systems of uh, key countries around the world, then it will be harder and harder for spontaneous acts of, 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 of uh, political opposition to dislodge them from these positions around the world. And, and therefore, I think in order to prevent that from happening, to prevent the PRC from acquiring the control of Eurasia's and Africa's littorals, which I do think is the strategic ambition for some of the geostrategists behind um, BRI, I think we need to focus on offering alternatives. And we should do that with a view toward ensuring the autonomy of a lot of these smaller countries. And, and Ike's formulation about why bipolarity helps smaller mm -hmm. countries is exactly spot on. Yeah. A little less sanguine that it's going to be uh, uh, good for us to cooperate with PRC on public health issues. And the only reason I say that is because we have cooperated with PRC on public health issues. We build up a world-class and very sophisticated uh, public health system in PRC after the SARS epidemic. Um, and unfortunate, and while that system seemed to work in the initial days of the COVID-19 outbreak, um, uh, in terms of detecting it, in terms of having heroic and sophisticated Chinese who wanted to stop it, um, the ability for the system to work was compromised by the CCP. I think the CCP understands that a lot of its outreach in Africa and in Eurasia is part of a zero-sum geopolitical competition that it is in. And so I don't really think that cooperation um, with PRC is going to be really, um, um, I don't think it's going to work. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to try, but to do so cynically. And, but, um, but I do think we need to be focusing as I had recommended on coming up with uh, real public health solutions to uh, this, this plague and, and, and particularly in countries where it's, going, where it's um, going to be sticking around for some time. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Patrick, some final remarks? Well, my final remarks would be to kind of recap my big takeaway from having read this excellent book and listened to this discussion. Um, we have to, in, in, in forming US policy, informing allied and partner policy, um, start with a diagnosis that Ike so aptly gives us in this book. The, the reason I didn't mention it in my remarks was because it's in his book. Um, everybody needs to read the book and they'll have a much better appreciation of what China intends, what Xi Jinping intends uh, in the directions where uh, Obor could go. Right after that though, we then have to make sure we have a realistic, even agonizing appraisal about our own potential and our limitations. And that's where I was trying to at least be realistic about our limitations. I've seen, I've seen the labors, I've seen the initiatives on the US policy, administration after administration, very difficult to sustain, to build. Um, so we're gonna have to be realistic. And that's where, once we understand those constraints, I think we come up with this sort of more targeted solution, the asymmetric developments you're talking about, uh, Nadia. There's even a bit of a, 
uh, competitive strategy going on here. In fact, we didn't talk about CPAC, the, you know, the, the China's biggest uh, sort of investment, um, mostly down the drain, as, as Eric was intimating in a sense, um, in terms of trying to build up this, this uh, corridor through Pakistan. Um, you could say that that was driven in part by US uh, investment in the power sector in Pakistan that's now gone away. But I mean, we were competing in effect. Um, some of that strategic, uh, um, uh, what, is, what is the phrase for Sri Lanka, the, the promiscuous uh, sort of strategic uh, competition, right? Strategic promiscuity. Strategic promiscuity. There you go, right, okay. Strategic promiscuity, it's, a, it's an extreme form of hedging where you're literally trying to drive the outside powers to outbid each other. US is a long record of being of falling for that one. Um, and sometimes it was worth it, sometimes it just wasn't worth it. Um, and I think the upshot of your book, Ike, is we can be much, uh, not sanguine, but we can be much more comfortable knowing that China has, uh, yeah, they've got a lot of ideas. Um, they definitely have some civil engineering capability, but they also have lots of challenges on the ground and at home, a lot of internal concerns. And we have uh, allies and partners, we have ideas, we have a lot of uh, sort of track record on, on creating new ideas and institutions and standards. So I, I'm ultimately optimistic over the long term that we can manage this and avoid that geostrategic coalescence that I agree, I think we're all in agreement, would be the worst case scenario coming out of OBOR. So thank you. I'm glad that you ended on a, on a high note, Patrick, to counteract <laughs> the comments earlier. So I'm, I'm always happy to, happy to end on a high note. I'd like to thank all three of the panelists today. I think as, as listeners know, the beginning of any improvement in policy has to begin with a more correct diagnosis of the problem at hand. And I think all of you have greatly contributed to a more nuanced diagnosis of OBOR, of what it means, and that in turn should help set a foundation, a better foundation for the US going forward. So I appreciate it very much. Um, I urge everyone to purchase Ike's book, he has not, uh, this is not a, a paid advertisement for Ike's book, <laughs> but it's a great book. And, um, and I look forward to, to staying in touch with you all and, and having some follow on conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.